Welcome, welcome everyone to come to this webinar during this、uh, surreal time today. And today we are going to briefly, briefly look at how a bad PHA or LOPA can actually go into damage your design of your safety system. So we are first going to look at where is actually PHA or LOPA that's in the IEC 65511 standards within the Life cycle, and then I will try to explain very briefly about the HAZOP and also LOPA methodologies. And、uh, these kind, these two exercises would pave the way, the specification for the design of the safety system. And then we will move on to look at the problems, what can actually go off, go wrong within the PHA or LOPA. And then finally, we will look at how that kind of consequences and what kind of impact can that bring about to be on your SIS and on each of the SIF.、Um, but before I actually go on and start the presentation, I would like to lay down a few foundation, lay down a few、um, points here first. So it actually will take days to coin the whole topic. And so it's very, very difficult for me to actually just to、uh, distill and concentrate everything just within one hour,、um, because we have to look at the whole IEC 61511 standard, look at the whole life cycle, in order to screen out where you can actually go wrong、uh, at different kind of failures. So、um, and also because of this、uh, massive information. That I would like to present you guys today.、Um, I won't be able to do a P Q and A session separately, but please, please feel free to type in your questions within the、uh, question panel, and I will answer them afterwards through email one by one. And the other thing is that a good or a bad hazard or loper can actually be very, very subjective. Um, I do understand that a lot of the facilitator usually just get in, involved in a stage of hazard or LOPA only, and they don't really need to worry too much afterwards.、Um, but for me, because I do get involved in other part of the life cycle or even、uh, life cycle that are related to us, IEC 61511. For example,、um, the alarm management life cycle. That is a separate standard to the IEC 61511, but it is a very essential aspect of your control system and also of the whole safety environment.、Um, and also,、uh, even within the IEC 61511 standard, because HAZOP or LOPA is going, actually going to impact your the design, the whole design of your SIS system. Therefore, I I usually get involved in seal verification, so I know how the seal level can actually be screwed up because of a bad PHA and LOPA. And I do understand there is actually nothing wrong, nothing wrong for a facilitator for HAZOP and LOPA doing their job, doing everything within the scope. But to me,、um, because I know the concussions, I would call them concussions and the damages afterwards. So. Uh, so therefore,、uh, I would like to take a few more steps when which when I try to address these kind of problems, especially when I'm a facilitator during PHA or LOPA.、Um, and also,、uh, PHA, LOPA, these kind of、uh, acronyms, these kind of abbreviations, I will talk about them during throughout the、uh, throughout the presentation, throughout the slides, and I will give you the right definition as well. So don't don't need to worry about that. And finally, today I need to focus.、Uh, I would like to focus on the functional safety. That's why I'm talking about IE six six one five eleven standard. And when we talk about functional safety, we are specifically referring to the SIS system,、um, safety instrumented system,、um, which is an automatic system. Therefore, when we talk about stuff like、uh, emergency stop, push button, those are not Within within the stuff that I would like to talk today, and also other kind of BPCS control system, I would would have kind of touched on it, but not to talk about it in details. So, 
since we have cleared this up, um, let's get started with everything. Uh, I do want to introduce a little bit about myself first. Um, I've been in functional safety for more than five years now, and I'm actually originally from the Asia Pacific office um, based in Hong Kong and working for the headquarters in Singapore. And I'm just recently transferred to the US around two years ago. And I started with this process safety as a, as a scribe for a HAZOP and SEAL selection workshop in Seoul in South Korea for actually I stayed there for three months. And afterwards, I keep getting involved in a lot of the risk analysis workshops. And later I became a facilitator for that. And also I have executed a lot of silver vacation projects. That's why I know how, uh, what are the difficulties and also the kind of concussions that a lot of the clients would face when they are just, when they do not really understand how the seal level work in a way that's uh, in compliance with the standard. And other than seal verification, I also facilitate a numerous of alarm management projects here in the United States as well. Um, also a little bit about Exeter. We are actually founded in 1999. Um, by several of the top, world's top reliability and safety experts. Back then, um, the founders, they, feel that, they felt that uh, the, the safety world back then wasn't actually doing right. And that's why I aspired by creating a better safety and also better safety standards. That's why we started out uh, this company in a way that we don't just do consulting, but we also we are also organizing these kind of webinars, we organize these kind of courses to have a kind of, a, we call them Exeter Academy, a kind of academia environment for everyone. And of course, our main focus would still be uh, industry automation, functional safety, alarm management, and cybersecurity. And we are a very, very customer-focused company. We, the main three parts of our work would be, first of all, we have our own tools, we have our own softwares, we have our own uh, Excelentia software with the Silver module, which is very, very popular because we use Markov port modeling for silver verification calculations for failure, PFD average modeling and all, for PFH uh, modeling. We do not use the approximation methods by most of the people out there, which, which can give you a more concise and precise uh, modeling and mathematic result, uh, especially on the seal level itself, uh, according to our standards, uh, according to our tools, sorry. And other than tools, we also have our own certifications. We, have, we do certifications for uh, different equipments, we also do certifications for uh, personnel. For example, the CFSP, Certified Functional Safety uh, Professional, or CFSZ, uh, Certified Functional Safety Experts. Those kind of uh, personnel certifications can make sure that, first of all, make sure that you are qualified to work in functional safety. And secondly, there's a very good potential to have to show the customers or the clients that you are capable and you have been assessed based on your ability. And there are also other kind of assessment that we can do. We call them functional safety assessments for the different part or stages of the lifetime of the plant. And other than that, we also uh, do a lot of life cycle services. For example, HAZOP, LOPA, those will be one of those. These, these will be mostly consulting uh, works that we do. All right, um, let's jump into the main theme of today's work, of today's webinar. So, HAZOP and LOPA. Before we go on and talk about the, in, in details about the methodology of HAZOP and LOPA, let's look at where exactly PHA or LOPA are. That's within the IEC 61511's life cycle. So this shows the IEC 61511 safety lifecycle. 
this lays out the life of a whole plant. And because IEC 61511 is a functional safety standard, uh, it is mainly about the SIS. As you can see, there are a lot of SISs over there. And SIS is actually an automation, is to achieve safety through automation. And that's why I mentioned that if it's just a push button over there, you need a manual activation of it. It is not functional safety. Functional safety is about automation. And this whole life cycle details about how to, first of all, formulate the concept, the specification of your SIS system, and then start building it, start designing it, and test for it, and then try to install it and validate it, and, and then start operating using the SIS. During the operation time, you have different kind of proof testing for maintenance, and manage all the man modifications and stuff. And finally, it would be the decommissioning of the SIS. So it described the whole life of the SIS, SIS system. That's why it's called a life cycle. And some people would actually uh, describe the life cycle as a kind of positive feedback loop because we have these kind of verifications, we have a safety life cycle structure planning, and we also have these kind of assessment, which is constantly monitoring each stages of these, of these different activities based on different clauses. And if something is going wrong, then we have a kind of a feedback. For example, if something has some something that went wrong and it's caught by the proof test, uh, and then, or maybe we start, to, we need to make some kind of modifications, then we need to feed the information back into the concept and feeding, do the hazard, do the hazard and risk analysis again, and then try to formulate a new design and then try to install it and then go it, go back in again. This is a kind of a loop that's keep, that's keep going on there. And why it is a positive feedback loop, because you are you keep improving the system. You keep having information passing from different stage up back into the initial stage and then re, re revalidate them and then reconsider them and try to improve the whole system throughout the whole life cycle. And that's why it is a positive feedback loop. And when we talk about PHN and LOPA, why it is so it is a very popular uh, topic to talk about is because it is at the very beginning of the safety life cycle. So what details actually entail within this hazard and risk analysis? That will be on the next slide. So first of all, PHA. PHA stands for Process Hazard Analysis. It's mainly to focus on identifying the different hazards and then try to find the hazards and then try to find the consequence for them and document them correctly on the either it's a hazard or it's a, a kind of H, a pha worksheet in a way and hazard itself hazard and operability study is a kind of method a kind of methodology for pha and is a, probably the most popular one and this methodology this output of this PHA process is mainly about the hazard consequences, the uh, the potential hazards, and if you are using HAZOB, you can get past some part of the failure probabilities out of that, some kind of frequency out of that. And what to do with these kind of information? We pass them on to the LOPA section. So LOPA stands for Layer of Protection Analysis. It's a continuation of the HAZOB activity in a way that, first of all, it tries to validate, to assess the val val validity of different kind of safeguards. And once they are valid, and we can call them IPLs, independent protection layers, and during LOPA, we also will do the likelihood analysis to look on the series of events and also the chain that's going through, ripple through the events in order to coin the hazard frequency 
the frequencies of the consequence. And after you get these kind of uh, information, these kind of uh, mathematical information, then you can use that to to actually coin the seal level of the sieve. And so LOPA is a is a way to actually quantify the hazard, the risk that you are going to face during the the different events for your plant. Since we're talking about SIS, um, Let's quickly look at the structure of SIS. So this whole um, this whole thing is actually the SIS, and each loop is a SIF, a SIF, safety instrumented function. And for each of the SIF, you have a sensor, you have a logic solver, and then you have elements, final elements. So that is the basic structure of a SIF. And if there's a collection of different kind of SIFs, then that would give you the SIS, the safety instrumented system. Let's look quick, quickly look at a definition of a SIF. A SIF is related to a specific single set of actions that are that are corresponding to the equipment that's needed to identify a single hazard and act to bring the system back to a safe state. Um, remember that that's why we, we have such focus on PHA, because each SIF is related to one single hazard. And within the PHA, we try to identify those kind of hazards. So that's why PHA is usually the very crucial, uh, crucial workshop or crucial process for the input for the design of the hazard, uh, design of the SIF designs, and uh, a SIF can be can be a kind of encompassing different kind of functions. So as I've mentioned before, uh, so one SIF can have multiple SIFs with different individual seals. So remember, it is always incorrect to actually say that you have a SIF of one single seal because a SIL is kind of attached to each of the SIF. Instead, and a SIF, a collection of different SIF, is actually going to contribute to a whole SIS system. So what to do with these kind of information? Now, you have the information from LOPA, and you have selected the SIL level for the SIF. So then, I don't know whether you guys are familiar with uh, software development, or any kind of engineering process, you need to have a specific a specification. Because without the specification, you don't really know where to go for your products. So the specification is actually a guide, guide is a kind of path, is, is it going to list and also let you know what is actually required for your safety system, for your, or if you're developing a software, it's going to, uh, show what is required of the software. So it is a blueprint. It is a basic list of stuff that your, in this case, a safety requirement specification, a list of requirements that you need to achieve for your SIF. And this would be a very simple example for an SRS. Um, for SRS, usually we would see uh, stuff like uh, what it would be the uh, test intervals, uh, what would be the response times to them, and very most importantly, uh, we see the service, what is the action for the SIF, and also the safe state, what actually defines uh, when the when the SIF is, con is completing its action in a way that's going to bring the operation back to a safe situation. So since we look at a brief understanding of how, where these hazard uh, LOPA and what is the purpose of this hazard LOPA related to the SIS system or SIF, each of the SIF. Let's look at the methodology in a little bit more detail. So, hazard. Hazard uh, is a methodology of PHA, of the uh, process <coughs> hazard analysis. So, 
during HAZOP, we look at different kind of parameters, guide word, and deviations. Um, for example, during uh, we look at a uh, pressure condition and we, we lay out a unit and then we look at different piping. We consider that uh, whether there is um, a high pressure condition and then we look at uh, what would actually cause that particular high pressure. For example, maybe a closing of a pressure valve that's going to create a high pressure upstream or create a, a back pressure in a way. Um, and then we're going to move on and talk about the consequences that's related to this course, to this initiating event. And the consequence that we talk about in HAZOP is about the ultimate consequences without thinking about any kind of safeguards. Because it is a way to uh, look at a situation, to coin the hazard, and then later we can pluck in the safeguards one by one. So it's a kind of elimination process in a way that it's going to give you a much comprehensive uh, way or procedural way to look at and also coin the hazard come in a more uh, structured and regulated manner. And after we have documented the ultimate consequences, we look at the safeguards and then start plucking each of the safeguards into the model into the worksheet. For example, there will be instruments, there will be relief valves, or maybe some kind of BPCF trips, or some kind of alarms happening, or there might be some, some kind of procedural documents or procedures that the operator has to have to complete in order to achieve that. Um, but it can be used as a kind of a safeguard, or maybe within the some kind of man, uh, mechanical uh, mechanical <clears throat> Obstacles make maybe like a kind of a dike that might actually protect and prevent some kind of a secondary spill to uh, to to have an even worse consequence in a way. And after we look at the safeguards, maybe we, we realize that um, the current safeguards are not really actually going to create, uh, actually going to prevent or maybe reduce the risk of the current situation of the current hazard that we're talking about. So we may have recommendations. Maybe we increase, we get one more trip in that. Maybe we uh, recommend there might be some kind of a, a redesign, some, some kind of a philosophy, new philosophy behind, or maybe we there's no alarm, so we would like to introduce a new alarms into the system, and that will be captured uh, by the recommendations. So now let's look at a very simple, simple example right here. So consider, consider this part of the um, operation where you have uh, cryogenic separations um, and there is a function to prevent a Brittleman fracture of the piping around this area. So within the HAZOP, um, we, we, first, uh, we first jot down the causes for that particular consequence. The consequence would be brittle pipe fracture. And that kind of brittle pipe fracture will result in a down, uh, kind of a possible fire in the downstream. And uh, what would be the cause? There might be because there is a flow imbalance between different streams, or there might be uh, a kind of a weather, extreme weather that might create such kind of brittle pipe fracture. So all these are being captured, as you can see, in a manner from the cause uh, to the consequences, and that's within the deviation of high pressure right over there. And then after we put down the ultimate consequence, we put down the, each of the safeguards that is going to be uh, related to this cause or this uh, consequence in a way. For example, there might be alarms and operators response that people that the operator can actually react to it uh, when there is a flow imbalance between different streams. But as you can see, in the weather extreme, there is no alarm or operator response because maybe because it's the weather, uh, an environmental weather problems that um, maybe that you can look at a thermometer, but there's nothing that's within the process that's actually going to tell the operator it's going to happen in a way. Um, but there might be other kinds of safeguards. There might be a process strip, a kind of BPCS strip in it, or there is a kind of sieve that is 
uh, going to uh, trip on a low temperature. So this is a very, very simple outlook of, um, of a hazard methodology. Um, if you guys are more interested in knowing a lot, a lot more about what exactly HAZOP is, please welcome to come to our uh, classes. We are very happy to talk about it because just about HAZOP, we can talk for over two hours. And we also have a separate course for HAZOP, actually. So I try to um, distill everything and try to cram everything into uh, this one or two slides. And do I have to do I have to apologize if uh, the concept isn't very clear uh, being explained here? So uh, let's move on to LOPA. LOPA is a kind of likelihood modeling. In a way, it's actually a fault propagation modeling. It's a kind of kind of a event tree actually, but a kind of a simplified event tree. Um, so it analyzes a chain of events that actually would lead to the accidents. Um, it decomposed a specific problem into different kind of events and then look at different kind of failures. These failures would be the failures of the safeguard. Um, and we, we calculate the likelihood using the kind of a probability logic using a chain over there. It'll be clearer when you look at this, this particular graph, this particular diagram right here. So considering there will be a initiating event, um, and then you have each of the safeguard over there, um, we, during LOPA, we assess whether those safeguard would actually be valid for this situation. And if there's this safeguard is valid for this particular initiating event, this situation, then we put them in put them in and put them as IPLs, independent protection layers. So this is one layer here. And then we look at the idea, we, we assume that if it fails, and also assign to a frequency to that, if it fails, maybe one out of 10, that if we fail, then we look at the next layer that's going, that's uh, the next layer that's going to cover this particular incident, maybe the first layer would be like an alarm, then the second layer would be a BBCF strip. And even if the BBCF, uh, BBCF strip fails, then there might be a SIP that is actually going to help. And then that will be the third layer. And then there might be relay valves and it might keep going on and on like this. It's like a tree that keep going on and on. And then finally, we will be able to go we will be able to arrive to the consequence that is actually going to happen. And we can use these, uh, the frequencies of the initiating event and also how uh, the failure, uh, the failure probability of these kind of FPLs. And then we can uh, do a calculations of everything and then we reach out to the hazard frequencies. So we can get an idea of how probable this consequence will actually occur in a way that we can pass that uh, mathematical value into the next step to select a kind of a seal level for that to understand what kind of burden that we are putting on. For example, if there's a sieve right here, what kind of burden that we were going to put on this particular sieve over there. So that is how the seal level is coming about. And these kind of calculations, uh, the frequency and the probability, sometimes we call them RF, the risk reduction factor. It's basically a kind of a, a kind of a, <clears throat> a kind of a inversion of the probability of failure in a way. So, but in a way that we can use that easily to coin the zero level. That's why we use the RF, the risk reduction factor. But about the IPLs we actually need to look at them differently. Um, there are different uh, criteria, actually, the IPLs need to fulfill in order to be an IPL, in order to be a valid IPL. First of all, it has to be specific. It has to be very specifically designed and be capable of preventing the consequences. If it is not specific to this hazard, we cannot really count on it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, for example, if there is a situation that you, uh, uh, there is a situation, for example, over pressure of a vessel, but you are trying to take an, uh, a kind of a high temperature alarm, 
it might it might it might actually work but it's not actually specific to this particular hazard um then that is not actually going to work in a way that is not a valid ipl over here and the other thing is that it is it should be actually independent and that is very very important because uh the idea of ind independency really really um the concept is not very clear across abroad uh when i do has of and LOPA, or even when I do simplifications. Um, <clears throat> because uh, independency, uh, it's, it means that it has to be completely independent from other protection layers, or, and also it has to be independent from the crawl, from the course as well. If the initiating event and the alarm that you, and you are trying to use, for example, if the initiating event is like a flow valve, but the alarm that you're going to use is actually related to that controller that's controlling the flow valve, then that is not an independent IPL over there. And the next criteria would be, it has to be dependable. It has to be dependable and acting dependable to able to be uh, prevent the consequence from occurring. And also it has to be auditable. That means that it can be tested and also maintained to make sure that the risk reduction is continually achieved. It's not going to degrade over time because you keep looking at it, keep assessing it to see if its ability is whether it's going to degrade or not. So let's move on to the main part of our discussion today. What can actually go wrong during a, a hazard or LOPA? First of all, I would like to look at the input problems. Um, the first thing I would like to look at would be the input problems on the PNIDs. And the other input problem I face, usually during HAZOP, would be the lack of design information when we do a HAZOP. So um, all these uh, examples are taken from uh, my own experiences. Uh, they, not, they do not exactly apply to the PNIDs that I'm showing. Uh, but they, they are real situations that I faced in the past. For example, the first one that we face here, um, there was a, like a unit that I went to and we, we had to do a hazard on this, but they have a lot of PNIDs like this with a big blank box right over there with just a label, for example, here would be like a nitrogen production package. And there's no showing of what kind of a, uh, piping that's involved within this within this particular package it only shows the outlying piping around and there are multiple pnids like that within the has of has workshop so in the end because we do not know the piping the valves and everything so we could not do a has of because when we do a has of we have to look the look at the point of failures we have to look at specifically what valve might fail uh, what kind of piping, what section of piping might actually fail in a way that is going to propel and going to cause that particular hazard. And in a situation like this with a blank package, we can at most only do a what if. So what, what we did was that we did like about a week of what if, what if, but after two or three months, after we received every information about these kind of packages, we went back and do about two or three weeks of hazard on that. It is basically a waste of time, a waste of money, and also a waste of resources. So that creates a lot of problems for the owner. Um, and as you know, the PNIDs are usually being prepared by the EPC. So unfortunately, that was a fault on the EPC's part. And there's another, there are other kind of problems right here. <clears throat> uh, for example, right here, uh, you can see there's a cluster of controllers over there. Um, it is doing some kind of uh, flow difference calculations and don't know what, what they are actually trying to achieve. When I first saw that, um, I was already thinking whether uh, something is, maybe they're trying, just trying to do it for, you know, uh, try to calculate the flow flow difference to to do it as a historian data only, 
But I've seen in the past in some kind of alarm workshops because alarm has alarm workshop has a lot of uh, involvement with the BPCS control system. I know that there should be something kind of some kind of trip over there. So it was uh, it turned out to be true. Um, the second and third editions revisions of the PNID we received afterwards was that they, they were actually trying to open. Uh, it's actually trying to open a kind of flow valve that suddenly pop up around this area. So that is a very, very serious problem because you are actually introducing a new failure point in a way that you are actually introducing a new hazard. Uh, hazard. And if we just finish that hazard within, without relooking at different kind of revisions, without knowing that there's a new valve over there, then we are actually going to underdesign the whole safety system. So that is a very, very horrifying consequence. But luckily, we caught that, and we were able to uh, tackle this particular problem. So other than PIDs, uh, we also recently, we usually also get into problems in different kind of hazards that we have problems with the lack of design information. For example, considering um, that is a vessel right here, that uh, it's going to have a feed gas that goes into a vessel, and there is some sort of a, a pressure, and also a sit right over there, and there are relief valves on these vessels um, to prevent some kind of overpressure situation. And uh, and it's logical to look at this uh, PNIDs, and uh, we can derive a kind of failure around these kind of valves right over here, and then that might result in the overpressure of the vessel. But during that particular uh, hazard, we did not actually have the design limit of the vessel. So we had to, what we did was we actually assumed the worst. Um, so that does, that was the one of the path that we took. We assumed that was the worst, worst, worst case in a way that there would be overpressure and because the feed gas was explosive and flammable, so there might be possible um, loss of containment, so there might be possible explosion. Um, but if the design information that is actually showing that is there's no, no way that the pressure that's coming in from the other units is going to uh, breach the design limit of this particular vessel, then this particular scenario is actually not valid. So we actually going, we actually introduce and kind of make up a new hazard, a, a hazard right over there, in a way that we are actually going to over-design the safety system. So maybe we put on more burden on this particular sieve over there, and uh, the sieve being at a higher sill level is not just about buying more expensive instrumentation, but also you have to maintain it. And also there's an overhaul uh, problem with it. And I'm going to go in details on that later, in, later in, the, in the following slides. And uh, the other path that some facilitator might take would be actually to assume that the design limit of the drum won't be breached. So there won't be a valid scenario, but if, the design can actually be breached, you're actually act actively ignoring a per potential hazard. And also you are actually reducing um, the seal level that's required on the sieve. So you are under designing your safety system, which is even worse in a lot of ways. And other than these design problems, there are also some kind of fault that being placed on their facilitator that had a kind of a misunderstanding of safeguards. For example, they would credit the wrong IPL. They did not think about IPLs as being independent. For example, where considering right here, there's a FV right over here. There's an initiating event, an initiating cause that an FV might fails at, in a way that might fully opens. And then if you take the FAH right here, the High, high flow alarm right here, then it is actually not true, not valid. It's a wrong IPL because this particular controller 
can fail and drive this FV open. So anything, any kind of alarm that's related to this particular controller is not actually going to help because it is not independent, because it's dependent on the cause. And the other thing is that uh, I do see that on a Hazard, Hazard record that people would actually take more than one credit for each of the PPCS loop. That is not that is not a right according to the IEC 61511 standard unless you have two fully independent BPCS loop. That is, you have full independency in terms of the uh, sensor, in terms of the equipment of the for the logic software. They are not within the same control system. They have two separate control system and separate uh, final elements. Then, in that case, you can take. Uh, two different PPCS loop in that case. Else, because each PPCS, they share one control system, the logic solving part of that um, PPCS loop. So every PPCS, once you take one, they are going to be dependent on the other loop. So you can maximum take only one PPCS loop in that case. And I also saw some very horrifying misconceptions of our alarms. I went to a refinery that, that was like a hundred years old, and uh, the manager over there uh, talked to me about a very funny concept about uh, human redundancy when they did the hazard over there. So he he thought that multiple alarms that could remind the operators in multiple times can actually help uh, help them from you know uh, to tackle the situation. But if we consider the snoozing uh, functionality of the alarms, the morning alarms that your phone has, we realize that we like to snooze it a lot. And maybe we have multiple alarms there, but we snooze each, each of them. And then after an hour, we finally start waking up. And considering that it is not a wake up alarm, it's not a morning alarm, but it is an alarm that's within the control system, um, that you actually need to act on within five or ten minutes, then you can't really wait for an hour to actually act on that. So this particular multiple alarms approach for that uh, for the as an IPL is totally wrong. It's actually being uh, pointed out within the ISA ISA standard for alarm management that we have to trim down the alarms and properly manage the alarm system in order to have an effective alarm system. Because alarm system is based on human, it's not based on an automation in a, in a, in a response way, in a responsive way. So we look at how things can go wrong in the in the LOPA and PHA. Let's look at a few of the concussions, I would call them, uh, the problems that you're going to give because of a problem that you had at a bad LOPA or PHA that's going to give to your SIS system. The first thing would be actually the wrong hazard for the SIF, and the second thing would be the underestimating the seal level, and then there would be overestimating the seal level. So let's briefly remind you, let me briefly remind you what actually defines a safety instrument as a function. So safety inf instrument as a function as a SIF is a specific single set of actions that is going to correspond to a single hazard to act on in order to bring the system back to a safe state. And that's why if we get the wrong hazard for the SIF, that is a big problem. What could be a wrong hazard? The hazard being completely ignored, as I have mentioned, for the design uh, inform lack of design information of the overpressure vessel problem. If we assume that the design limit is not going to breach, we are actually ignoring a whole hazard. And then there won't be a sieve to prevent that particular hazard, and there is a very dangerous situation. And also, a wrong hazard is also, also going to affect the safe state. We probably won't be talking about safe state in HAZOP, but safe state is a very crucial information within uh, the, SI, uh, the SRS, the safety specific requirement specification. 
And the safe state is actually related to the hazard because safe state defines when the operation is safe. So it actually defines what situation the SIF needs to achieve. The SIF has different kind of actions that needs to achieve a particular uh, safe operation state for the whole operation, for the whole plant in a way. Let's look at a very brief um, example right over here. Considering there is a furnace situation and there are eight different valves that feed gases into the furnace and within the HAZOP, it is said that the, the consequence would be there would be an overfiring of furnace and there might be furnace damage and ultimately there might be put up a potential explosion and also loss of containment at the end. So then the safe state is a little bit ambiguous. So um, it's a safe state actually, we, do we need to completely shut down all of the furnace? Or, because if we need to shut down all the furnace, we need to close all eight valves. Then if you know about silverification, closing eight valves, eight out of eight is never going to achieve any kind of seal for you. And that is actually a, a very common problem when I see people talk about overfiring a furnace. Because um, if, if a overfiring firing a furnace, the furnace can sometimes, some, for some of the integrity, the design limit and also design the integrity of the furnace can actually allow that to happen up to days or even up to weeks in a way that it might not even create that kind of an explosion or loss of containment situation. So if in that case, in that case, we're actually overestimating the hazard, the consequence in this situation. So in that case, um, maybe uh, it's just an over firing of furnace and some kind of operability issue to the operator. That would be actually might be the right consequence for this case in a way that the safe state that the SIF needs to achieve isn't actually to shut down the whole furnace, but maybe just to reduce the output of the furnace. And if you just reduce the output of a the furnace, then do you actually need to close all eight valves? Maybe you just need to close one or maybe one out of two valves uh, that's going to feed some uh, the main, main fuel gas line that goes into the furnace. So that's how safe state can affect the, uh, the first of all, the number of uh, final elements or number of equipment, the instrumentation that you need to choose. And also it's going to affect how you outlook the whole, whole hazardous situation over here. So, um, the other thing that uh, usually we have the problem is underestimating the seal level. Um, so that would mean that a sieve actually achieve a seal level that is lower than the seal it actually needs to achieve. And the sieve cannot actually prevent the hazard or cannot mitigate the hazard, cannot actually uh, reduce the risk of a, have a significant safety level to reduce the risk of that particular hazard. And um, there are so many stories about how things blowing up within the safety world. And I can list all the past information, past uh, situations or cases um, about explosion to you guys. But I think you guys, uh, because you guys work in the process industries, you guys, or maybe you guys work as a manufacturers, you know how these stuff works. So I won't be focusing on listing out all these kind of cases. Um, rather, I'd like to more, focus more on overestimating the seal level. But before I go on, I need to remind you guys about what exactly seal level is. Seal level in the hazard analysis phase, in the seal selection phase, is, is actually mainly about choosing the right number based on the hazard con uh, frequencies or the risk that is trying to prevent. But when it comes to the design of the sieve that it needs to achieve a particular seal, it is more than just those kind of a failure, which we would call random failure. Um, 
failures that occurred and random time that result because of the degradation mechanism within the hardware. And the PFD average and PFH would show that particular aspect. Uh, but according to the standard, you have two more stuff, two more points, two more pillars to look at. The first one, the, the first additional one that you need to look at would be the architectural constraint. Um, it can be 1H route or 2H route, but we mainly look at 2H route because we are we work in the process industries. And the architectural constraint is related to the uh, hardware fault tolerance, which is related to the voting, to the architecture of the sensors or and also the final elements. And the third pillar, the third pillar, the second additional pillar that you need to look at is about the systematic capability. Systematic capability is trying to describe the systematic failure that you can face during the design of that particular instrument and also the manufacturing process and the operational uh, procedures or documentations or, or other kind of human errors that can come into the design into the operation into the process of them of manufacturing this particular equipment that's why it's not random failure it's not it's not a kind of failure that's coming out of the um it's not coming out of the random degradation of the hardware so that is what systematic capability is trying to look at and uh, when we look at a systematic capability because we actually do uh, certifications for different uh, instruments. When we look at system capabilities, we're actually going to audit the whole process, audit your manufacturing process to look at different kind of operational manuals that you have um, when you try to manufacture this particular, in this case, a logic solver over there. So um, that's why it is a separate entity separate entity than a random failure random capability and also separate entity than the uh, uh, root 1h the hft this would be describing the architectural constraint over here and pfd average would be describing the random capability over there so if you see uh, a certificate for a um, particular equipment that don't really list all these three things then you realize that that is not actually uh, be compliant with the standard in a way. And if you need to have a higher system, ca systematic capable equipment over there, for example, a SIL3 capable um, for the system maker capability, you're definitely going to be buying a more and more expensive equipment because they're, it's much, much more difficult for the audit process, for other things, increased number of things to be audited during when you try to achieve that particular systematic capability. And uh, about architectural constraint. Architectural constraint here in IEC 61511, they only have one table. This table is actually identical to the route, uh, to the route 2H in the IEC 61508. IEC 61508 is like the mother standard for the IEC 61511. And IEC 61511 is applicable towards process industries. <clears throat> so um, that's why we only, because of that, we only need to look at a, this particular route to H. Uh, I can't go into too much details about the difference between 1H or 2H because um, that is also going to take like two or three hours. Um, so, but the easier way to think of it is that one age, you need to think about the, uh, the safe failure for your particular component. But here, you don't really need to consider that because the IEC 61511 standard only, you only need to look at this particular table. And this is related to something called HFT, the hardware fault tolerance, which is basically your voting. So as you can see, if you want to achieve a CO2, uh, for high demand or continuous demand, uh, how about a SIL3 for any kind of mode, any whether it's low or high, you need to have at least one for HFT. 
for the hardware fault tolerance. In that case, you can only have architectures like one out of two, two out of three, or one out of two D. At least you need to have, that means at least you need to have two equipment for either sensors or, and also the final elements, the valves. So that means that you need extra equipment. So in that case, you actually need extra equipment on that. Um, so it's going to drive up the cost, and also it's going to give you more problem for maintenance as well. And, and talking about maintenance, let's look at random, random failure. This PFD average, this is an approximation. It is approximated equation only. In a real life situation, we should always use Markov modeling too when we calculate PFD average. But this, as you can see, can actually show you, show you the relationship between TI, that would be the, <clears throat> the proof test interval, and the MT. MT is the lifetime of the mission, the mission time, the lifetime of the whole SIF. So that means that if you have a higher uh, proof test interval, that means that you do your proof test less frequently, then you have a higher PFD average, that means that you have a higher failure. And also, if your mission time, it means that, it means that if you want to use this uh, particular equipment for 10 years, and instead of just five years, then you're also going to drive up the PFD average over there. So in that case, first of all, maintenance, you need to do more proof tests frequently. And then you also need to change out or overhaul your equipment more frequently if you have a higher seal level than is actually required in a realistic sense. So that's why it's going to create a lot of cost, a lot of uh, drainage of resources for you if you over, whenever you overestimate the seal level in that case. And uh, of course, there are other impacts for of a bad uh, PHA or LOPA, especially I do a lot of alarm rationalization projects, a lot, a lot of alarm uh, management projects. I see a lot of crazy alarm configurations that's coming out of the PHA on LOPA, who just keep uh, recommending, we need an alarm, we need alarm. We just put a lot of alarms over there in a way that we're going to take out during alarm management again. So it's a, it's a, it's a negative feedback loop in a way. And um, it's also going to affect your BBCS configurations. People might um, falsely understand that we can take more than one um, one credits for BBCS trips, so they inc include a lot of BBCS trips in it, in a way that because BBCS trips has a lot of safe failure, has a very high safe failure, failure rate. So then you have, that's going to increase your spurious trip. And in a way that is actually going to increase the downtime of your plant as well. And actually, um, I would like to add one more idea about uh, the hardware fault tolerance. Because the higher the voting, I mean, more and more equipment of the voting, like one out of two or two out of three, even though the hardware fault tolerance of them are the same, but two out of three has a higher safe failure rate in a way that it will increase the spurious trip for you, for your plant, so that it will have a higher downtime of your time, a higher downtime for your plant as well. So that you can see, it's going to ripple through the whole design, the whole structure, the, the whole operations of your, of your whole plant. So that's why we, that's why I always advise people to choose the right facilitator, to choose the, a good uh, consultancy to when you, whenever you do the hands-off or LOPA, because it is going to impact you very, very uh, horribly. And it's going to give you concussions for the upcoming up to 10 to 20, even 50 years, if you want to operate your plant that long. So um, the time is already nearly uh, about an hour. So uh, if you guys could uh, type out your questions you, in the question panel, I'll be happy to answer them one by one through emails. So um, I'm sorry that I can't do a separate Q&A sections for you guys today. Um, 
if you have any questions, as I mentioned, type out in the question panel, or you can send me an email right over there. And I do advise that if you guys want to know more, please consider joining uh, our Exeter Academy, joining our courses. And uh, the most uh, relevant course that's related to this to, to this particular topic would be FSE 100. Um, we have online live courses, uh, and we also have self-paced online training courses, which you can do it like a Skillshare or do it like a, a Lynda.com thing that you can self-paste it through the whole process. And if you want to know more, please considering following us uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, and also LinkedIn. And again, I welcome all questions. If you guys can, please drop down my uh, email and write me something and ask me about uh, anything that you come up with or anything that you don't really understand. I'm happy to answer your questions. And thank you very much for joining us, everyone today in this webinar. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you guys next time as well. Um, and that will be all. Thank you. And have a very nice day. And stay safe during this surreal time of COVID.